Hi, everybody. I'm Kyle, and I'm here to talk about the Nassau Republic of Pirates. I have a story to tell you of a rebellion, of a democracy, of a merry band of thieves whose seafaring exploits would bring transatlantic trade to a standstill, and whose tiny island of freedom for every race and every gender amidst British imperialism would shake the empire to its core. In 1696, the golden age of piracy was in full swing. Henry Avery, the king of contemporary pirates, loaded his ship up with plunder from Indian training vessels, you know, like as one does. <laughs> and needing a place to hide out, he landed it in the British port of Nassau on the island of New Providence in the Bahamas. The governor called an emergency meeting of the town council and said, well, uh, maybe this giant pirate ship's actually a good thing. It'll, uh, it'll deter the French from attacking. This actually worked. See, the French and the Spanish weren't afraid of the British. Pirates, on the other hand, who pirates. Pirates would attack you. Pirates would steal your shit. Pirates would give no quarters, supposedly. Worse yet, many pirates' crews were actually made up of escaped slaves, and there's nothing that scared 18th century Europe more than people of color given a weapon and a modicum of power. The war between the British and the Spanish ended in 1713, 17 years after Avery's landing in Nassau. But the Spanish kept attacking British privateers in the Caribbean, even though the British were no longer employing them. Enter privateers Benjamin Hornigold and his protege Edward Teach. They decided to take up revenge against the Spanish for raiding and imprisoning their privateer friends. All they needed was a ship, a good crew. There's gonna be so many fucking ships in this talk and a base from which to launch their raids. Hornigold and Teach knew just the place, Nassau. This was the blank slate onto which Teach would write history. This is the Caribbean as it appeared in the early 17th century, and this is the island of New Providence, <laughs> home to Nassau, where the Pirate Republic was being born. The Spanish, who would never allow a black man the position of navigator, were easy prey for the pirates who, with a diverse and a loyal crew, knew all the twists, the turns, the anchorings, and the ambush spots around the Caribbean. The Spanish never stood a chance. Starting in early 1714 with just 75 men and three sailing canoes, Hornigold and Teach soon became the most successful, famous, and feared pirates of the Caribbean. In the fall of 1715, the Nassau pirates took up their own name, the Flying Gang. Pirates signed on for hope of a better life, the Royal Navy used press gangs to force people onto their ships, which were horrendously overcrowded with a crew expected to die, many of abuse. But the Flying Gang, on the other hand, they ran a true democracy. Captains had absolute control in combat, but outside of combat were subject to democratic elections, impeachments, and only 50% more compensation than your average crew member. That's right, the Pirates of the Caribbean experienced better workplace equality than you experience during your workday. Meanwhile, the population of Nassau grew by the day. It became a safe haven for pir pirates, prostitutes, indentured servants, criminals on the run, escaped slaves. It was a dream come true. With hundreds of hovels and lean-tos on the islands, the city had now become a destination for some of life's most piratical debaucheries. Fornicating, singing, dancing, drinking, fighting, smoking, everything worth your time. Nassau had it. Nassau had everything necessary for a modern Golden Age pirate. It's around this time that Hornigold captured a six-gun sloop, a one-masted sailboat, and he granted it to his loyal lieutenant, Teach. Hiding fearsome eyes behind a more fearsome face, braids of a massive beard tied with ribbons, Teach began to call himself Blackbeard. Now, rather than use his sword, Blackbeard relied on his reputation alone. No records actually exist of him killing anyone until his final battle. He saw himself as a Robin Hood figure, a sort of really good, loyal Englishman, stealing from the corrupt and the rich and giving to his crew, using a intimidation and reputation as his only weapons. His reputation among his comrades saw him promoted to the magistrate of Nassau, a civil officer of the Republic, able to apply the laws he saw fit. Nassau had business, law, and elections. It was a true pirate republic. Meanwhile, an Englishman named Wood Rogers was obsessed with pirates. <laughs> Since returning from Madagascar in summer 1715, they were all he could think about. 
He led a successful campaign of clemency to the pirates there, and it stuck in his mind, assuring him that all pirates were just wayward sailors who deep down really desired to return to crown and country and God. Uh, Rogers was thrilled that the pirates in Madagascar had accepted his clemency, and he was quick to beg his patron, the East India Company, to send him on another voyage, and they knew just the colony, half worlds away, that could use his skills. Rogers approached King George, who agreed to name him Governor of the Bahamas and grant clemency to all pirates who surrendered to him within one year. Using only, <laughs> using only his own fearsome image, Blackbeard caught the prize that would define his career, the Queen Anne's Revenge, a 40 cannon vessel able to reach impressive speeds. Blackbeard allowed the crew to head home on his old sloop, the one that Cornigold had granted him not even a year earlier. It was a crew member who came aboard this ship that told Blackbeard of King George's act of grace, the offer carried by Woods Rogers to pardon anyone who voluntarily gave up their life of piracy. The pirates thought they had given up their law-abiding selves for laws of, uh, lives of rebellion and adventure. They thought there was no going back, and here staring at them was a second chance. Upon the act of Grace's delivery to Nassau, the pirates there immediately split into two factions. The first faction saw themselves as English loyalists. They were thrilled to have the mercy of their rightful king. They rushed the Fort Nassau, and they raised the Union Jack. But the other... Uh, the other faction, they rushed the fort, they raised a different flag because they were still committed to their image as Robin Hoods of the West Indies. Even these pirates, though, they still saw themselves as Englishmen, loyal to Queen Anne's line, royal rather than King George's. In a world of swashbucklers and thieves, this was actually a battle of competing ideologies among English royalists. The pirates, ever democratic, called a council to resolve their differences, but there was so much noise and clamor that nothing could be agreed on. Blackbeard was a pirate at heart, but he was also a prudent strategist. He knew the golden age of piracy was coming to an end. Blackbeard and his crew rode to North Carolina to discuss a pardon. Blackbeard was prepared to pay 2,500 pounds, plus more, so long as the governor didn't ask too hard where it had come from. Uh, and Blackbeard's crew would disperse, and Blackbeard himself would settle in North Carolina. Meanwhile, Woods Rogers had arrived in Nassau. Stepping into the fort, he unfurled a scroll, and he spoke to an assembled crowd of around 300 pirates there. The king had appointed him the governor of the Bahamas and was offering clemency to all of the pirates who surrendered to him within one year. This should have not been possible. A man of the government stepping into pirate-controlled territory telling them that he was taking control and that he wanted them to give up being pirates? And it wouldn't have been possible if it weren't for this story's very own traitor, Benjamin Hornigold. Hornigold had none of the reservations Blackbeard did. He accepted the pardon immediately. He assisted Rogers in imposing martial law on the island. Hornigold was the king of these pirates. He was an undisputed leader. He was a man of skill and success. But Hornigold was the king, and when he led, Nassau followed. And Hornigold was cowed, and so was Nassau. Rogers knew an asset when he found one. He asked if Hornigold would take on a new career, tracking down his old friends as a pirate hunter. He accepted immediately. Benjamin Hornigold set off in search of Blackbeard, and the Crown's martial law ruled in Nassau. The Republic of Pirates suffered an undignified death in 1718, just five years after Hornigold and Teach had truly founded it. Blackbeard stayed in North Carolina, plundering small merchant ships and using the governor as a fence. The governor of Virginia, who was cross about the danger of the pirates, illegally hired two sloops to tackle and take him down. Celebrating a recent capture, Blackbeard's crew was drinking heavily. They slept, only to be awakened by two sloops rapidly approaching, cannons loaded. These were some of the most fearsome pirates of the Caribbean, but they were also tired and really hungover. Blackbeard put up a fearsome fight. He jumped aboard a sloop and he broke his sword. He died fearsomely, with five musket balls in him and 20 cuts all over his body. He was beheaded, his body thrown in the sea. According to legend, it swam around the ship three times before sinking to the brackish depths. Woods Rogers would have his comeuppance. With the pirates defeated, the crown seemed to have forgotten he existed. He went tens of thousands of pounds into debt. King George fired him, his creditors moved on him, and unable to pay, he was thrown into debtor's prison. The golden age of piracy, the man who had ended it, he was put behind bars. Benjamin Hornigold, founder and destroyer of the Pirate Republic, stayed in Nassau, hunting down his old friends. What a dick. <laughs> After a couple of years of successful pirate stalking, Hornigold was killed in a storm in 1719. No longer home to pirates, Nassau grew impoverished. The fort damaged, the economy in shambles, the island town deteriorated. 
only to be replaced by a series of Hiltons 200 years later. <laughs> and with that, I would raise my glass to rebels on land and in the air, in space and on the high seas, to stealing from the rich, to giving to the poor, and most importantly, doing whatever we can to disrupt colonialism wherever it appears. Thank you.